Bless the Lord Jesus. I want to greet you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and our King. I welcome you tonight to another Bible study. Amen. As we continue along the theme for the year, earnestly contending. Tonight it's, you know, my pleasure, praise God, and, and I hope that I'll be able, amen, to impart the powerful message Amen. That is imparted in the book of Jude, which is where we'll be looking at tonight. Praise God. You know, Bishop Daly was laid on his heart for us to look on the topic earnestly contending. Praise God. And tonight we are going to, we want to know uh, where that theme comes from. And we want us to understand that the whole theme of earnestly contending is really a biblical thing. It's something that started as early as the first century. And it's my privilege tonight to try to look at what the scripture has to say you know the book of jude is one of the shortest books in the new testament but it's power packed it has a lot of information and a lot of things that we can pull from it and even apply in this season in the 21st century you know the bible talk about in the latter days some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Amen. The Bible tells us that we must, uh, must be careful, we must look out for in the last days, many will be deceiving and will be deceived. And therefore, it's important that we understand that the whole principle of contending for the faith is something that the Bible has told us about from as early as the first century. Praise God. So I greet you tonight and I welcome you to another Bible study session. I want us to bow our heads right now as we go into prayer before we start, amen, this Bible study. Let's bow our heads together. Great God, we thank you, God, for tonight. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for your word. Your word is spirit and your word is life. You said in your words that where we talk, shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed to the word of God. And I pray right now, God, as we are about to look into the perfect law of liberty, as we are about to embark again in your word, as we are about to break bread, I pray, God, that you'll prepare our hearts to receive a word from you. God, we don't want to hear from a man. And we are all, God, Jesus, fallible. But you are the infallible God. You are the God which changed not. You're immutable. And therefore, you're a holy God. And you're a God which is able to speak to us even in this time. I pray, God, for every hearer tonight. I pray, God, that you'll help us, Lord Jesus, to not just be hearers, but at the end of this study, praise God, that we will be doers and we'll become even more wise in the word. Thank you, God, for what you're about to do and for what you have done already as we look to you who is the author and the finisher of our faith. In the mighty and the most exalted name of Jesus, I pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God bless you as we go right into the study tonight, talking about earnestly contending for the faith. Praise God. Now, we'll jump right into the verse. Our key text tonight is from Jude chapter 1 and verse 3. And Jude writes, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Praise God. Now, tonight, at the end of the session tonight, I want us to have five main things. There are five main objectives that I want us to definitely uh, get what the Bible study is about. Amen. At the end of the study, we should have a reason for why Jude wrote his letter. And by, by the way, we see Jude in our Bible, but you know, in the Hebrew or the Greek, it's also called Judah. Amen. So you might see Judah in other translations or so, but it's really, we want to find out the reason why Jude had to write. Secondly, we will look at the teachings that exist against the faith in the book of Jude. And what we're going to realize is that nothing is new under the sun. Because the same thing that were happening in the first century amen, is the same things that are happening today. The devil has no new strategy. But what he has done, he has come with the same old things. Praise God. And therefore, it is said that a wise man amen, will, will learn from his 
failures but a wiser man will learn from another man's failure praise god and therefore what we realize is that jude is written for us so that we can learn from what took place in the first century we're going to look at god's will and judgment against sinful lifestyle because when we go contrary to the faith amen it leads us into a sinful lifestyle fourthly we're going to look at the issues in the church in jude's time and then how did jude address these issues praise god and lastly i like the fact that he didn't just push the issues at us but he gave us recommendations amen he made recommendations to how christians in today's day amen even from the first century right to know how we can combat the issues that will come into the church now let me start with the background that you know the book of jude amen was really written between about ad 65 and about 90 ad and um, some scholars would suggest that it's about ad 50 somewhere there it doesn't matter but the letter was written to address false teachers who had infiltrated the christian community and were promoting destructive hearsays so it's apparent that from the epistle that jude uh was coming against some teachings some some evil teachings and some obnoxious teachings that had come into the church now he started his epistle by stating that he was going to write of the common salvation beloved when i gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith so what had happened is that jude originally was going to write about the common salvation that they all share in the church and it's apparent that that was his initial motive amen but something had happened and he was brought to jude's attention that they were persons who had come into the church and they were bringing with them certain type of teaching and he said look i know i exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith so jude upon receiving information about the false teachers uh he found a way in his writing to encourage the saints to contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints praise god now it's very important that we define certain things um we want to ensure that we understand what the scripture is talking about so we're going to define certain things starting with when we talk about the faith what are we talking about when we say we are contending for the faith what are we talking about normally in scripture uh when you talk about faith um in most cases many people when they think of faith they think about uh, a strong belief in something and um, that's what people normally would think faith means but i want us to notice something as we define what jude was talking about in relation to the faith now there are 30 or so times the bible speaks of the faith and i want you to note the following every time he's talking about the faith the definite article uh, is placed before the word faith and that indicates that the bible is identifying both a singular and a specific thing amen it was not just talking about faith as in belief but it was talking about the faith i mean and every time the the comes before it it is making reference to a specific or a singular thing secondly every time we talk about the faith it's it's constantly ascribed to the apostles so the faith amen is linked to the apostles and what they preach in the first century amen is always affiliated with the apostles and the first century church now if you can look at a particular verse um that incorporates what i'm saying um from acts chapter 16 verse 4 to 5 it says and as they went through the cities they delivered them the decrees for to keep 
that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the church established in the faith. Amen. And increased in numbers daily. So here it is that we realize that, as I said before, all three elements are placed there. One, we see that the definite article was placed before the, the word faith. Secondly, it was linked to the apostles. Thirdly, it was linked to the church. Can I talk about the apostles and the elders which are at Jerusalem um, so that the church can be established. Praise God. So the key point I want us to note in relation to the faith is that firstly, the faith is one body of facts delivered by authoritative people. And those persons are the apostles. In other words, there is no new the faith. Amen. The faith that the Bible is talking about that we are contending for is was delivered by person who God had given them the authority to deliver it. Secondly, the faith was once delivered. Amen. This means that it does not need any more addition. What we have in scripture in those 66 books, amen, was once delivered and therefore there needs to be no addition. Now, to highlight that point, we're going to look at the, the phrase, which was once. Now, as I said before, the, the, the New Testament was written in Greek. So in Jude chapter 1 and verse 3, when the Bible says, which was once, it's three words in the English, but it's one word in the Greek. And that one word is hapax. And it means once. It means one time. It means once and for all. Now, why is this important? You see, there are many major cults that exist today. People like the Mormons who claim that they need to be more revelation in the word that, than that which was written in the New Testament. Amen. But the epistle of Jude actually deals with that issue head on. It says, look here, we need to contend for the faith which was once delivered, one time once and for all delivered to the saints and therefore we must contend for that there needs to be no new revelation and, and, and you have to be careful in this season and time because we are living in a time where every preacher wants to come with something new everybody wants to get something some deep revelation in scripture and in what normally happens when they when when that is their focus amen is that they tend to go air indoctrinally because there is no new revelation we are contending for the faith amen which was once delivered now there's a principle called the principle of first mention and i want us to understand the first time that we find the definite article the faith in scripture was in acts chapter 6 and verse 7 in the new testament it says and the word of god increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient what to the faith. What are we seeing here? Immediately, and Acts chapter 6 is like two or three chapters after Acts chapter 2. What took place in Acts chapter 2? The church was birthed. The, the church the, what God promised them that he would establish a church in Matthew chapter 16 had started in Acts chapter 2. So now in Acts chapter 6, the Bible is talking about uh, there was a rapid expansion of persons who began to subscribe to the things believed and taught and practiced by the apostles. And among these persons were those who previously belonged to other faiths. So in the 6th chapter of the book of Acts, it is said that the priests aligned themselves. Let me, let me paraphrase what is happening here. They aligned themselves to this new movement, the church. Uh, and they renounced what they had originally believed. And they subscribed now to the beliefs. They subscribed now to the teaching. They subscribed now to the practice that the apostles now were teaching them. Amen. So... As a church, 
let us understand, let us expose clearly uh, what are some of the things that were believed, that were taught, and were practiced by the apostles that still hold true today. There's no new revelation to these things. And this is not an exhaustive list, but this is some of the major things. The apostles, they preach the oneness of God. Amen. There needs to be no revelation on that. And, and what is happening in this season is that you have people coming in and they're attacking the core tenets of the church. And they're saying, boy, it's not one, it's three. And even apostolic teachers and preachers have removed themselves from the faith and they are teaching things contrary. But these are some of the things that the apostles preach. They preach the oneness of God. They preach the creation of man and his fall. In other words, we, we, we were created by God. In, 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 I will see that in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And we realize in Genesis chapter 3 that man fell. Right? We preach repentance. We preach water baptism in Jesus' name. These are pillars. These are what we are contending for. We preach baptism of the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues. There's no new revelation. Nobody in the 21st century can get the Holy Ghost different than the people who got it on the day of Pentecost. We preach divine healing. Praise God. God is still in the healing business. Amen. And it doesn't matter how things look. I strongly believe that God, well, the word of God teaches that God is still able to heal. There is still a balm in Gilead. There is still a God who is able to touch sick bodies and restore it. Amen. We preach communion and the foot washing. Amen. This is something that was practiced as early, even before the church started. The Bible says in St. John chapter 13, where Jesus practically washed Peter's feet and he took a towel and girded himself and he put up water in a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. And this was symbolic of the fact that I am your servant. Amen. I serve you. We preach the grace of God. Amen. We preach the holiness of living. And, 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 and this is what is attacking in the church. A lot of people want everything else, but they don't want to live a sanctified, a separated, a life that looks different and going contrary to where the world is going. We preach the translation of the saints. In other words, we preach the rapture. That's what it means. Where God is going to come and he's going to take out the saints. We preach um, sacredness of marriage between one man and one woman. It doesn't matter what the world is teaching. Marriage is between one man and one woman. Amen. There is not no marriage between one man and another man or a woman and another woman. Praise God. Marriage is between one man and one woman. We preach the second coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming again. And his feet is going to touch that mountain. It's going to split in two. We preach the millennium. Where Jesus is going to establish his kingdom on this earth for a thousand years. We preach the final judgment. The white stone judgment. These are some of the things that the, 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 the faith is about. So we talk about the faith. These are the body of beliefs that we preach and we teach as a church. And therefore, as a body, we are contending for the faith. Now, let's look at what happened. So now we are going back to, to what happened in relation to Jude. Now, Jude got a message that false teachers were coming into the church. Now, I want you to notice something. This is the reason why he wrote that particular letter. The first point that Jude addressed was the fact that there were false teachers who had crept into the church. He said he realized that men had come in unawares. For there were certain men crept in unawares who were before of all ordained to this condemnation. But before I even jumped to that point, I want us to note verse point two. These men who have obviously denied the faith, were not men from the outside. I want us to make note of this. That is why it's very important, child of God, and, we're going to, and Jude is going to address this, but it's very important that we get into the word, the simplicity of the word, the simplicity of what the Bible teaches, because what is going to happen is that 
key is not the, 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 the attack of the enemy is greater on the inside than it is from the outside. Amen. When the attack comes from the outside, it is obvious that's an attack on the church. But when you have people who have been established themselves in the apostolic church begin to go contrary, then this is where the serious attack comes in. Because what is going to happen is that because you're already known to be somebody in the body, it's going to say nothing is wrong. It must get a new revelation. So Jude established that these men were not from the outside, but these were men inside the church who had still maintained a membership inside the church. I will say that in Jude chapter 1 and verse 4. What does it say? For there are certain men who crept in unawares, praise God, who were before of all ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men. They were turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, it means then, as children of God, we should not only be vigilant on what is happening on the outside. We have to be vigilant of what is taking place on the inside. And, and, and therefore, when you see people start removing the marks and removing the landmarks and, and moving a little edge here and a little edge there, and they're saying that there's nothing wrong with it, brethren, understand that the Apostle Jude, hallelujah, was dealing with this issue as early as the first century. But notice how these false teachers came into the church. The Bible says they were doing two things. They were one, they were turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. We're going to address that. And number two, they were denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So these men were teaching against the faith and they were doing it by turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. And two, they were denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does it mean? Because we're in Bible study. And it's important that when we come to Bible study, that we get a good understanding of what the scripture is teaching. So what does it mean that they have turned the grace of our God into lasciviousness? Firstly, they were changing the grace of God into a license to live an immoral, sexual, degrading life. You see, what had happened, brethren, is that they were, they, were, uh, they, were, uh, they were combating a lot of the present day teaching in their time. There was a Gnostic teaching that states that, look here, your body is, uh, is, is not holy. And therefore, God has nothing to do with the body. Everything about you has to do with your spirit. And therefore, it does not matter what you do in your body. It doesn't matter what, what, what you wear. As a child of God, why is this important what we wear in church? Why is it important that we don't do this and this? It's just your body. I can, just, I can wear anything. I can do anything. Amen. Because the grace of God is so great that it covers the sins of the body. And this is a false teaching because they have changed the grace of God. Amen. They, and you know the grace of God is practically God uh, uh, giving you lenience, as it were, for something that you deserve. So you deserve to die and God's grace says you shall live. And what they're doing, they're changing the grace of our God in a license to live an immoral and a sexual degree in life. So what had happened is that no, because they say nothing is wrong with what is happening in the body, amen, they were doing all kinds of sexual acts and saying nothing is wrong with it. Because guess what? It's only been done in the body. But my spirit is intact. Amen. Secondly, they were saying that the grace of God is so broad that it will forgive you of anything you do. And we have to be very careful of this. Because what you're going to learn is that the Bible, and we're going to talk about this later on, but the Bible teaches us things explicitly and implicitly. Let me define. And we're going to go on. But one of the teachings that are taught um, implicitly 
from scripture is that look your God sometimes can cut you off we saw it in the case of Saul Saul decided that he's going to do what he wanted to do uh, and he thought that boy he probably would have gotten forgiveness but the Bible teaches us that he sought for repentance and could not find it brethren we have to be very careful that we don't make uh, we don't make the grace of God of no effect we don't try to 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 abuse God's grace but these people were teaching that the the grace of God is so broad and it is that God can forgive them anything you do and he can but guess what we have to be careful because the Bible says in Hebrew that if we sin willfully there remain no sacrifice for sin and th th there's a whole part of theology behind that which I won't go into tonight but let us bear in mind that this is what these false teachers were doing they were turning the grace of our God into a license to sin they were turning the grace of God into an, a, 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 a place where you can do anything and anything praise God so today we see a similar doctrine that exists in in the churches where it is based on the Christian theme of love nobody wants to be offended anymore and if you teach something they say you are not teaching out of love my God if you love someone they say it doesn't make any difference what you do with them because love justifies anything that's a lie from the pit of hell it's very important that we understand as children of God that we cannot turn the grace of God into a license to sin secondly they were denying the only Lord God and our Savior Jesus Christ in other words they promoted false teachings and practices and the fact that you do that you are denying God they distorted the true nature of Christ. As a matter of fact, they, there was even a teaching that says that the body of Christ was not fully human. They say his body was divine and therefore he was only able to live the life he lived because he had a divine body. But that's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible says God was manifesting in the flesh. Amen. God had flesh just like you and I. Amen. The Bible said he was tempted in all manner like we have. Amen. Yet without sin. So they, they, they try to distort his nature to say that the only reason why he was able to do this is because the body that he had was not like the body that we have. But he had just, if he didn't have body like you and I, then he could not represent you and I. One of the reasons, and I've said this before, why the high priest could not be Moses is because Moses did not come from among the people. In other words, as even though Moses was the leader of the people, note God did not choose Moses to be a high priest because the high priest must be touched with the feelings of your infirmities. The high priest must understand what you are going through. And therefore, in order for Jesus to be our high priest, he had to come from among the people. He had to become a man. He had to grow up. The Bible said he learned obedience, Jesus, by the things he suffered. In other words, he understood what you and I go through. But the false teachers distort the true nature of God. They deny the divinity and the authority of God and Christ. They rejected the idea of Christ as the only way of salvation. And that's, and that's a troubling point. And that was based on the fact that they believe in secret revelations. They believe that there are certain people who would get certain revelations about, just like Jesus had it, there are other revelations that can lead you to God. Amen. But Jesus made it plain that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. We see teachings like this coming up today. We see Oprah Winfrey telling that you have many ways to God. Brethren, we have to be careful what we are listening to and what we watch and what we feed ourselves with. One of the problems that is happening in this season, and we have noticed this, that after the COVID period, a lot of issues came into the church. And why this happened? Because during the COVID season, while there was not church, like they know it, a lot of people tuned on to every and everybody all over the world. And they're seeing all of these things. And therefore, they begin to feed on all of these things. And guess what happened? It affected the way they see church. But I come against it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They promoted alternate parts and false doctrine. They rejected the authority of the apostles and other church leaders. 
and they promoted their own teaching and authority and they denied the true identity and authority of God and Christ. Praise God. This is what the false teachers were doing. Praise God. And this is what, uh, when, when, when they start to interject these things, praise God, and these men who have crept in unaware begin to push these things, you realize that the apostle Jude had to address the matter. Praise God. He, he, a matter of fact, he, he probably would have been one of the brothers. He's one of the half-brothers of Jesus Christ. Jesus had about four brothers. He was one of the half-brothers of Jesus Christ who got saved. Amen. After Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. And therefore, people wanted to know, hear something from him. And as I said before, his early address was to write about the common salvation. But there was a bigger issue at hand. Amen. We were sure that that, that that bishop would want to say this is the year of blessings. I was sure we want to say this is the year of this. But there is a bigger issue at hand. And therefore, brethren, it's important, and God has laid it on our pastor's heart, that we contend, not just contend, that we earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered. Now, when you go contrary to the faith, Amen. I want you to understand that the Apostle Jude let us understand that there is a punishment for this. God will always judge sin. No, God will not ignore sin. And the judgment of this kind of person is 100% certain. When they enter the church and they trouble the body of Christ, amen, it is certain. Amen. The judgment on them is very certain. And the Apostle Jude uh, gave three biblical examples of how God deals with men who refuse to act by the faith. And acting by the faith means you are going contrary to any of those things that I mentioned earlier. And Jude says, look here, I will therefore put you in remembrance though he once knew this. In other words, it's obvious couple stuff. It's obvious that Jude was writing to an audience that understood the Old Testament. Because all the examples that he's going to use going forward is an example that came from the Old Testament. Amen. Secondly, it is important that we understand that Jude did not just come up with uh, a teaching by himself. But he used the word of God to address those persons who were acting contrary to the faith. So he said, look here, I will therefore put you in remembrance. In other words, false teachers, all those persons who want to go contrary to the faith, I'm reminding you of what happened to people who go contrary to these things. People who decide to do things their own way. And he used three biblical examples so that he could remind us of what will happen. So in Jude chapter 1 and verse 5, he says, the Lord... Having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. My God. Let me stop here. Here it is that God decided that he was going to take the children of Israel out of Egypt. Amen. They were in a state of bondage. They were, they were under the, 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 the rule of the Egyptians. They were slaves in the land. And God decided that he was going to pull them out of that. Having saved the people out of the land of Egypt. Because of their unbelief. Amen. He destroyed the people. Imagine. Over one million people leave Egypt. And of the one million or one point something million people. Two million people that left Egypt. Only two of those original set made it into the promised land. And you know why? Because they did not believe the word of God. And guess what? God showed us in scriptures, firstly, how God will judge sin. He showed that God saved his people. He took them out of Egypt. He brought them through the Red Sea. He was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He brought them to Sinai. He gave them the law. He gave them the commandments. But yet still, because they did not believe, the Bible said God destroyed them that believe not. When you go contrary to the faith, what Jude was saying is that God will destroy you. But we're going to talk about that later on. The second example that Jude used was the angels. So first we see Israel. Secondly, we see the angels who kept 
not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He had reserved in everlasting shade unto darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. Now, in the there's a Jewish uh, teaching, there are some Jewish books uh, that, that, that would address some of this. And Jude was fully aware that they were knowledgeable of what this was talking about. Uh, many people link this back to Genesis chapter 6. That's one of the Jewish teachings. That angels came and they stepped with men. You know that type of teachings. You have Christians who don't believe this. But you have some Jews who hold to this. And this is what Jude was making re reference to. He said the, the angels never kept their first estate. They left their own habitation. And now God, because of what they did, whatever it was, God had reserved in everlasting chain unto darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So first we see how God dealt with Israel. Then secondly we see how God dealt with the angels. Because they went contrary to what the word of God teaches. Then thirdly he talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. And the cities about them. In like manner giving themselves over to fornication. Going after strange flesh. And set forth an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So Jude brought out three this examples and this is for a purpose because you want us to understand that God deals with sin but how God deals with sin is his prerogative amen so from the examples Jude was reminding us that God does not take sin lightfully and he also wants us to know that the punishment of sin comes in three distinct ways and that is why you cannot use somebody's way or God, how God deals with somebody to judge how God will deal with everybody. Amen. Because his way of punishing sin can come in three ways. Number one, in the case of Israel, and this is what Jude was saying, it came about in natural course of event. Amen. In other words, God ensured that because of their unbelief, they spent 40 years going around and around in circles, never entering that promised land. And God did not move them from out of this wilderness until all of persons who had left uh, the promise, left Egypt, had died. God used nature, amen, to punish the people. You know, some things that we might go through because we are, we are re rejecting the faith can come by natural courses. Brethren, let us contend. Let us hold faith. Because the punishment for going contrary to the faith can come in a natural course of event. It can come in a way where it happened over a five-year period. You wonder why this is happening to me. And this can be a punishment from God. Secondly, it can be long delayed as in the case of the fallen angels. In other words, their punishment is still ahead of them. So you have some cases where your punishment is along the course of nature. You have secondly, where it seems like everything is going okay. But guess what? Your punishment is reserved. And that's what Jude was saying. That Look here, when you contend, or when you, when you go contrary, sorry, to the faith, your, your punishment can be natural course. Your punishment can be reserved. So, it looks like they're getting a blessing. People who walk out and decide to do what they want to do, it seems like everything is going okay for them. But for some, what had happened is that the punishment against the sinful act, amen, is delayed. Just like the fallen angels who wait in change or in chain for that day when they will be punished. But thirdly, the punishment can be sudden, like in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, where instantly God just poured out something from heaven and destroyed the city. The lesson from this is that God will not ignore sin and means he chooses to punish sin in his prerogative or better yet, the way he decides to punish sin is his prerogative and not ours. But what we learn from this is that we have to earnestly contend for the faith. Amen. And when you go contrary to the faith, your punishment can be one of three ways. Now from this, Jude move on to more concrete what was happening in the church at that particular time 
he went directly now having addressed these false teachers he started to look at the body as a whole and he addressed the issues and can i tell you some brethren these are similar issues that we are seeing happening amen when you decide to go contrary to the faith when you decide to deny the faith you're going to realize that these are similar issues that we are facing today so jude says likewise also these filthy dreamers they defile the flesh they despise dominion and they speak evil of dignitaries my god so after jude mentioned that in jude chapter 1 verse 8 he went now to address each of these issues but in reverse order so first thing he dealt with was speaking evil of dignitaries then he went on to talk about despising dominion then he went on to talk about defiling the flesh so he says what happened to these people who decide to go contrary to the flesh he described them as filthy dreamers who defile the flesh despise dominion and they speak evil of dignitaries so these are the three things issues that he mentioned that happening in the church they speak evil of dignitaries my god they despise dominion and they defile the flesh now let us look at how jude looked at these and let us see how best we can apply it to us today the first example he drew for in jude chapter 1 verse 9 to 10 was michael he said michael the archangel when contending with the devil he disputed about the body of moses does not bring against him a railing accusation but said the lord rebuke you so michael in what we call the judeo christian uh, society or theology is one of the highest ranking angels this was not one of the baby ones as a matter of fact i tell people all the time in the book of revelation where the bible says that an angel bounded the dragon amen and and, and had him in chain for a thousand years that greek word for angel was just a common angel god was bringing up the point that god is not even going to use one of his high-ranking angels to bound the devil who is going to use it just a little simple common angel to show that the devil is nobody in his sight but michael on the contrary when we talk about michael in the christian theology and in judea uh, uh Jude, Jew, jewish theology we're talking about somebody who is high ranking he's not one of the baby angels and according to jude michael was disputed with the devil over the body of moses now this 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 particular scripture is not found in our bible but it's come out of a jewish uh, book as it's called the assumption of moses so here it is that jude is making reference to a book like a normal book that they would read in their jewish society and he said look at this example when michael was contending for the body of moses after moses died you know he just said that the the his body was there and the, the, the devil wanted the body because obviously he's sin and therefore he's supposed to, this is my property that's what the devil was saying but what he didn't know is that there came a point where god covered moses even though he did not make it to the promised land but when you read the new testament it was moses and uh I remember elijah that was on the mountain of transfiguration where were they they were in the promised land so god is a good god but anyway the devil don't understand who god operates and he thinks that he knows things but but according to the scripture when michael was warring with the devil over the body of moses notice what michael did the bible said michael did not accuse him the devil of anything in other words he did not try to say old devil you but instead the bible said he appealed and that's what jude was saying he appealed to a higher authority than himself and he said the lord rebuke you now what was he saying here judas was emphasizing the importance of being careful and respectful towards authority figures just as michael was careful amen and respectful respectful in how he address other powers in other words michael knew who the devil was he knew the devil was a fallen angel but he was very careful in how he addressed him 
Nowadays, we find that people will say any and anything about authority. And that's what, that, that is what Jude was saying. Even the angels understand authority and are respectful and the devil is a fallen angel. And the, Michael didn't bring any railing accusation against him. But in today's time, what we are finding is that people are, have no respect towards authority. People will say, a funeral bishop that. And they will talk things uh, that not knowing that they are causing judgment upon themselves. False teachers in Jude's day mock celestial power, praise God, and, and the things that they did not understand. In other words, they, 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 they were arrogantly speaking against the things of God, thinking that they are doing something good. They rejected the authority of those who God had appointed as leaders to teach the people. And the, as I said before, they were influenced by Gnostic beliefs, which thought that only a selected few had access to secret knowledge, my God, and that the physical world was evil. And therefore, they rejected the authority of the spiritual leaders in the church, and they speak about them in ways that we, we, we don't need to follow them. But guess what? Jude was saying it's important to receive the God-given authority that has been set up and be mindful of what we say about them. I have a friend uh, and this friend will always say, look here, before I talk about pastor, make a pray. And I respect that. Even if you're not in agreement with what? Some things. You have people who are so loose mouth, not realizing that when you speak against authority, you are speaking against God. So Jews emphasize this. Then he went to the second part about despising dominion. And when he went into despising dominion, Jude again pulled for three examples. So in point one, amen, we talk about uh, we talk about speaking evil of dignitaries. In point two, we talk about despising dominion. So there is a movement now where you not only speak evil, but now you start despise dominion. And he brought out three examples of how this works. He described these false teachers, these people who despise dominion, these people who reject the faith. And he used three Old Testament characters. He spoke about Cain, he spoke about Balaam, and he spoke about Korah. And these three examples that he was talking about emphasize three main points. One, he talked about the lack of love. He talked about where we are greedy for money and then we are rebellious towards God-given authority. So, in addressing point two about despising dominion, he brought out these three examples. Let us jump into what these are. First of all, he talked about Cain. The story of Cain is found in Genesis chapter 4. And what had happened is that Cain had become selfish and decided to do things his own way. He had no concern for his brother Abel and desired to worship God how he felt the way he wanted to do it and not God's way. And this is how things start. You know, I, I, I'm in New Converts and um, Lady Daly is teaching on the whole subject of conviction versus standard. And, and there's a point that she brought out where she said that people will say, Oh, it doesn't matter what I wear. If that brother lost after me, I see him business that. This is doing exactly what Cain is doing. You have no concern for your brother. And therefore, you desire to worship God in the way you think it should be done and not God's way. But can I tell you something, brethren? When you do some things like this, it's not just your brother's problem. It is also your problem. And it's a matter of being selfish. That's why you do this. It's, it's being selfish, thinking about your own self and not thinking about what will happen when you wear this or you do this, how it affects your brother. Praise God. So, first example he brought up was the example of being selfish. And selfishness will lead us to do things that we don't want to do. So he moved to Balaam. And there are two stories about Balaam. You may say, when you're selfish, you're moving to a, a level now where you start to do things that you wonder if it's you this. So the first thing he did in Numbers chapter 22, the Bible said he, he, he was hired 
by a pig, uh, by, 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 by a king, I mean, to curse Israel, if you can remember. Um, Balak hired Balaam and said to curse Israel. And on his way to curse Israel, it is said that the, 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 an angel appeared before. And the man was so adamant in doing what he had to do that even that did not stop him. Can I tell you something? When you have become selfish in what you think, then nothing that a preacher preached, that even, no matter if it comes from God, amen, the next day you're going to do the same thing again because guess what? Nothing stops you. You have become self-absorbed to the point now where it doesn't matter what the preacher says. It could be an angel from heaven. It could be God himself who come down and give a word to you. Amen. You're going to continue to do what you're going to do. Even if we tell you, brethren, that clothes that you wear is too tight because it's affecting the brethren. I said, look, I don't care. I don't care about it because you have become so selfish that you don't realize it affects yourself. So, Balaam was so adamant in getting money. He was so moved at what he had to do that this one, even the angel appearing, he wouldn't stop it until the donkey had to talk. My God. God is showing the extent to which he's trying to reach out to these false teachers. To the point where the donkey spoke. And even in that, the man was just upset and adamant in doing what he wanted. He was blind uh, and he wanted to do what he wanted to do. And guess what? When you're blind like this, you also pass on your message and your blindness to others. Amen. That's why you have to be careful who you even keep as friends. Because having reached out to a point... Where he not only was couldn't stop and realized that he could not curse Israel, he decided to introduce them to pagan worship. He began to decide to look here, just let the women, uh, pagan women, mix with these people. Let them, be, as Brother Billy would say, mixing and mingling. And therefore, in Numbers 25, we see how it moved from just being selfish. Move to a point where you're adamanting doing what you want to do. And not only that, that you're adamant, but you're teaching other people. My God, help me, Holy Ghost. You're teaching other people that look here, nothing is wrong with it. The devil is a liar. I mean, it is better, I think it's worse a sin when, when not just you sin, but when you start teaching other people how to sin. So when people, the false teachers start coming and say, look here, nothing is wrong with that. Things that you have been preaching for years, standards that you have hold, things that have held this apostolic body for years that has kept us distinct and separate from the world we have people coming in nowadays and say look here so what we've been preaching for 2000 years is nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with separation anymore amen you don't need to be separate you need to be inclusive of everything that's happening the devil is a liar you have become selfish you have become moved in your own way and therefore you you, you are teaching other people how to do it and then the third example he used was quora notice the progression Korah was defiant against Moses and Aaron. We find it in Numbers chapter 16. And he, he, so this is what happened. You become selfish in what you want to do. You're adamant in doing it. You're telling people that look, you're, nothing is wrong with it. And then guess what? You start to go, you start to become defiant against spiritual authority. That's what happened. So I tell you, these scriptures are powerful. You know? There's powerful message in it. It's showing you the progression of what was taking place. So Korah was defiant against Moses and Aaron and he speak out against the authority I know what God had to do with him and, and, and you can look for it in Numbers chapter 16 God said look here alright Korah if you decide that you're going to speak out against my authority let all the matter for Korah go to one side and let all them that go uh, for, for Moses come to another side and those that were for Korah the Bible said the ground just opened up and swallowed them alive dead my God as Christians, we should not despise dominion or go against God's prescribed way. We should love each other and not remove the old landmark. Don't be selfish towards your brother. Love each other enough to say, look here, I need to do something to protect you. And, and, and brethren, I'm not, I'm not claiming to be perfect. What am I saying is that God looks at your heart and look at where you want to be. Amen. And, 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 and therefore, when you reach a point where you realize that I am affecting the brethren. You think, say, a sister, when you get up, or a brother, when you get up and him put on him clothes, and him look at him and say, how is this going to affect this and this person? They're going to change. They're going to be full convicted. 
Christians should not become consumed with love of money to teach others to sin. You become so consumed with what you're doing. In the case of, of, of Balaam, he was so consumed with money, the love for it, that it didn't stop him to the point where he go as far as to teach others to sin. And at the end of the day, we must obey God-given authority. As, spies, as wise spiritual leaders are appointed by God to watch over the church and are accountable to him. My God. You know, I, I, I always tell people that the, 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 the measurement of a, 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 a leader is not necessarily how much people follow him because you're going to have people who reject him at times, you know. Um, Jesus was the perfect leader, but being the perfect leader, he still had a Judas. Not because some people decide that they're going to go contrary to what the bishop teach. means that what the bishop teaching is wrong. You must obey God-given authority. Obedience to God-given authority is obedience to God himself. Let me say that again. Obedience to God-given authority is obedience to God himself. Say it again. Obedience to God-given authority is obedience to God himself. I hope that's sinking. So he brought out these three examples to show us the progression of what takes place when we go contrary, when we, when we do not hold on to the faith. Now the apostle Jude warned against the third point he made now was defiling the flesh. And if you can remember, we talked about that earlier. Where we talk about the three things that, 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 that will happen to, the, to them. One, they uh, speak evil of dignitaries. Then two, they despise dominion. And then three, they, dis they defile the flesh. I'll just bring you back to show you that I'm still on those three points that are found in verse 8 of Jude chapter 1. Well, it's one chapter. Now, the Apostle Jude warned against defiling the flesh in Jude chapter 1 verse 12. Now, what does that mean? They talk about the love feast. In other words, the Bible talks about the feast, uh, feast of charity. That's how it's, 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 it's termed in Jude chapter 1 and verse 12. Um, some translation might call it the love feast. And it was a feast that was shared among men in the early church. And it's interesting that Jude pulled for this. Now, the false teachers spoke about Christ and divided the group into clique. Now, what had happened is that in the feast or the love feast, what they usually do is that you have different classes of people, different set of people would have come, and you know, like on a service on a Sunday, after the service, we'd all meet and they would eat and they would eat together. It was a, it was a custom that they would have. But after a while, these false teachers now start to come in, and the Bible said there were no spots. In their feast of charity. What does that mean? In other words, the false teacher tried to destroy the fellowship by becoming selfish and not caring for others. The love feast was no longer about sharing and caring for one another, but became a shameful and selfish event. What had taken place is that, brethren, uh, no, and that's why we have to be very careful of cliques. Because anytime you start to have cliques into the body, Amen. What is that happening is that people are going to be for this friend and not necessarily for the entire body. So what had happened now, the food was supposed to be shared among everybody. But the feast now, the spot in the feast of charity says, I'm going to take the best things. And only those who are my friends can get access to this. And what is left is given to you. That's defiling the flesh. Where we start having cliques in the body. I mean, you only when you come to church, you only care about your friend. But you don't realize that the sister that sits beside you also is equally as important as your friend. As a matter of fact, when you talk about the body of Christ, it's called a body. I know body is singular. It means that we are all connected and joined together. And therefore, I can't say I'm going to feed my nose and not feed my toe. I mean, it's, I mean I'm going to feel the pain. Everything has to be distributed equally among the body. And therefore, Jude was saying, no, the, what is happening is that you are, you are creating little cliques. And you know, I've seen this in the past where the little cliques cause problems because now this is the clique that will speak evil against dignitaries and speak evil against the leadership and say, boy, let me not 
care about this one and that one and because they have their little click they feel like everything is okay it's a it's a, it's a it's a trick of the devil it's a trick of the devil to separate you from the body brethren let us not be so fooled but let us realize that we all need each other to survive so jews went on to give a remarkable sense of imagery against people who defile the flesh against people who despise dominion and against people who speak evil of dignitaries and i'm not going to read it but i think it speaks volume for itself when you start to get into that type of thing so look here there are clouds without water my god carried about by the wind in other words they're here today they're not here tomorrow they're they're in today they're out tomorrow they're, they're, they're like a cloud and the wind is just driving them back and forth you don't know what they're for who they're for they're just all over the place if said there are trees whose fruit withered amen they're they're like trees without fruit the bible said they are twice dead my god in other words you're dead and you're dead again praise god you are plucked up by the roots and when you're plucked up by the roots it means that you're disconnected from the source that gives you uh, nutrients. They are raging waves of the sea. In other words, they cause a lot of problem. They are foaming out their own shame. They are wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Uh, this is poetic, but it's very deep in terms of what he's saying. When you look at him describing people who despise dominion, when you look at how he describes people who speaks ill of dignitaries, when you look at him describing people who defile the flesh, amen, you're like nothing in the eyes of God. You're wavering, you're like carrying about by the wind. You're moving back and forth. You're like wandering stars, my God, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Help me, Holy Ghost. Jude went on to describe the attitude though. So, he not only just tell you about the people, he might give you a no concrete description of people who behave like this. So, no, no, no just tell you who they are and how they look. He start to describe more their attitude, how they operate. And these are some, I tell you, you know, the Bible gives you all the things to look for when you come out to these type of things. People who come in and try to mess up the thing. He gives you Clearly what happened. The Bible says these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own loss, and their mouth speaking great swelling words, having men's person admiration because of the advantage. Now, I didn't want to just leave this one here. I wanted to define each of these terms so that we can understand what they're talking about. Murmurers, grumblers, whiners, a person given to excessive complaint and crying and whining. Everything that has been said, I am troubled. I am offended. You can't preach holiness again. You preach holiness and you're troubled. You preach holiness and it's about how no longer is no longer about truth. And it's a, it's, a, it's a trouble that's affected even the very world. Amen. It's based on how you feel. So if you feel like you're a man and you're a woman, then you're a man. If you feel like you're a woman and you're a man, then you're a woman. If you feel like you have no sex, and if you say to somebody, look here, if you call a woman, a woman, she, and she says that she's not a she, she's offended. And can I tell you something? These little things, and they say, look here, don't call with she, call with they. And they're they bees. The devil is a liar. These little subtle spirits have come into the church. So once the preacher or the teacher speaks against holiness, they have become murmurs and grumblers and whiners. Uh, uh, complaining and crying and whining. You have offended me. That's a new term. Everything that happens is troubling and offensive. But the devil is a liar. But we said they are complainers. A person who is dissatisfied and rebellious. They are never satisfied with what is happening in the body. Everything they complain about. They are walking after their own loss. They follow their own desire. They don't try to, to, to get into the spirit of what is happening. But their own desire and lust, that's what they want. So things must be done according to how they say it must be done. But they don't understand that the wisdom of God is wiser than men. And the foolishness of God is... The, the, the weakness of God is stronger than men. And the, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. In other words, what you think might not be how you want it to be done... You can trust that God has a 
place a leader, amen, who is following in God's footstep. And therefore, it might not be according to how you want it, but it might just be that thing that saves your soul. But we talk about mouth speaking great, swelling words. They are loud mouth boasters are brothers. Boy, if I did me in that position, me that do this and me that do that. And a lot of them, if they are placed in the position, the whole thing crumbles. They have immense personal admiration because of advantage. In other words, they're flattering people to gain the advantage. It reminds me of, of, of Absalom who stood at the gate and he ensured that everybody who passed him talked to them about David. You know, these people who said, boy, Bishop now go on with nothing, you know. The, the leadership now go on. No, this is not now go on. And they stand at the gate. And they tell people all kind of things. But we need, as Bishop said the other day, you need to run people like these. Flattering people to gain the advantage. They have, they have some form of, of advantage. And they feel that like they're educated. And they know more than everybody else. But I'm happy that this is, has nothing to do with intellectual. But it has to do with us following the mind and the word and the things of God. Now Jude gave us some recommendation in terms of how to deal with these things. Firstly, how do we combat an attack that is happening from the inside? How do we combat an attack that is coming against the faith? Now Jude put it this way. He said, build up yourself in your most holy faith. My God. In, in other words, he was saying, study the word of God. Like he said to Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that need not to be ashamed of rightly dividing the word of truth. How do I do this? I learn what the Bible has to say. How do I do that? You understand that I said earlier, the Bible teaches in explicit ways and in implicit ways. Explicit meaning, it involves direct instruction and clear explanation of concepts, of skills, of procedures. So, explicit teaching says, Amen, do not do this. Don't do that. Amen, like in the New Testament. Don't do this. Don't do that. But you have implicit teachings also, which teach us that, uh, teach us through stories, through modeling, through discovery. Amen. So when we read in the Old Testament and we realize what happened to Korah, we know that we can't speak against our authority. We look what happened to Moses and what happened to Aaron. We realize we can't do some things our own way. When we look what happened to Uzziah, amen, who the Bible said when he became strong, he decided to go into the tabernacle and offer up sacrifice himself. And even when the priest was telling us, look Uzziah, don't do it. Amen. He decided that he was going to do him thing. And the Bible said, while he was there, leprosy just came upon him instantly. And he lived the rest of his life, amen, outside of the camp as a leopard man until he died. We look upon people like, um, praise God, like Saul and all these men who decided, we learn implicitly through their life, through their story. Amen. Build up yourself in the most holy faith. Learn what the word of God has to say. Amen. In relation to how we deal with issues like this. And explore the truth of the word. So that you can be in a position to defend the truth. When people come and talk against leadership. And talk against this. And decide to live how they want to live. And decide that look, nothing is wrong with this. You can say look but even though the Bible don't say directly this. There is a principle implicitly in scriptures that says. I must dress a particular way. I must be modest. I must look different. I must stand out. Amen. I'm a royal priesthood. It says I'm a holy nation. I'm a peculiar people. People must look at me and say, boy, there goes an apostolic. There goes a saint of the Most High God. Just like they could identify in the 90s that there goes an apostolic. No, you don't know who is an apostolic. But build up yourself in your most holy faith. That's how you attack these things. You separate yourself from the world. Amen. You look different than the world. You talk different. You walk different. The second thing he said, he said, pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray according to the word of God. Let the word of God be your guide in how you pray. Like David. David says, um, your meat have been my uh, day and night. You know, when, when he described how he was thirsty for God. Amen. When he described what, what he was going through, pray like that. Amen. Pray the word. And obey what the Holy Ghost says when you pray the word. Psalm is a good book to use. Pray the word. God, I don't understand, but I'm praying. God, I don't understand what is happening, but I'm praying. As a matter of fact, before you attack some things, because some things are, 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 are not, not all revelations are given 
instantly to everybody overnight. It's just like I was I I I I, I a good teaching example the other day. I was in a class and I'm doing I'm doing a course, and the course is called Topics in Advanced Algorithms, and it's it's, it's, it's very complex, a lot of mathematics. My no, my daughter Kristen loves math, so she decided because it's on was Washington Zoom, and she decided to come and and to look at what was there. At the end of the class, she said, Daddy, I don't understand a thing. No, I could understand, even though she loves math, she's not at the level to understand what was being taught there. It doesn't mean like 20 years from now, she won't grasp this. But there are some basic concepts that will lead her to that. It doesn't mean that what was being taught is not math. It's just that means that her, where she is, is not at the level to understand that level of math. In other words, as the Bible says, as newborn babes, we must desire what the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. There are some things that are probably above your head. You don't get it yet, but you cannot be it. And then if eventually God will give you the revelation about why you do what you do. Some things are not, it cannot even be explained. The most you can say is that you're a child of God and you decide to be different. But later on, when you're convicted in your spirit, you're praying the Holy Ghost, and you begin to understand, and God begins to reveal some things to you. You realize that it was making sense all along. He says, keep yourself in the love of God. It means to constantly walk in the light of God, so that you can inspire the true love of God. As a matter of fact, if the love of God is not burning brightly in your heart, one day you'll even lose the consciousness of God's presence. When you realize that when you're in the flame, start burning low. After a while, you're not even be able to detect the presence of God. Did you know that? And let me just make this point. Why is it important to keep yourself in the love of God and keep that flame in your heart going? Did you know that every other thing that was lit in the tabernacle came from the brazen altar? You know, that, that first altar, which is the biggest altar, the biggest of all the furnitures. When the fire of God came down, they had to take the fire from that and light everything else. In other words, you keep yourself in the love of God. When you keep the fire of God that is on your altar of repentance, burning everything else. And when you realize that you're going low, where well, you need to go back to? The brazen altar. What is the brazen altar? A place of repentance. When you realize that you have lost your consciousness of God's presence, you're not feeling the presence of God, you need to go back to that big altar. It is said that every furniture can hold inside of the brazen altar. You know why? Because that's the most important furniture in my opinion. It leads us to everything else. And lastly, look for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. This speaks to a life of expectancy. In other words, unto them that look for him. And this is one of my favorite verses. Shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation? And I tell people all the time, one of the reasons why the apostles lived a life that, 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 that obviously contained for the faith and was distinct and was, was not so troubled uh, by the things of the world is because they were looking for him. They were like the soldiers. I have a brother who is in the army. And recently, like two days ago, I was carrying him to work. I saw him on the road. He was on his way to work and I picked him up. So I have a brother who is a soldier. As a matter of fact, I have a nephew now who is a soldier also. His son. So on my way, I was asking him, so what is Upper, not Upper Camp, Newcastle like? And he said, look here, when you become a soldier and they bring you to Newcastle, you don't even have a phone. Right now, he's a staff sergeant. And for him to get to his son, he has to call another senior person. And because he's a senior man in the army, they will make him talk to his son every now and then. But truly, when you go to Newcastle, you are separate totally from the world. That's what the Bible says. When you're a soldier, you don't entangle yourself with the affairs of this life. In other words, when, you, when, you, when, you, when your mind is so focused on his coming, then the little things that we are troubled with self about. Oh, oh, Bishop, I want to wear jewelry. Oh, Bishop, I want to wear pants. Bishop, I want these things that we are troubling ourselves with. It shows us where our mind is. The apostles were so powerful. So not troubled that no wonder the, the, the miracles and, and wonders appear with them because they looked for him. And to them that look for him, you must live a life of expectancy. Jude is telling you, recommending to you how you can uh, live a life, amen, that combats 
these things. Now Jude mentioned three things concerning our attitude now. So apart from you, he mentioned three things about our attitude that are coming down. About how we actually now should live towards others. So we're talking about combating uh, these false things that has come into the church. He said, look here, in some cases we must do three things. We must convince some who doubt. You're going to have people who know and then when doubt some things and say some things. If you can, you can if you can convince them, you talk to them and say, brethren, you might not understand it yet, but you know, keep holding on. Convince those who doubt. You know, those who, who, who have a doubt towards the faith. Those who have a doubt towards the teachings. Convince them. And just some people, you see some of them by snatching them out of the fire. So you convince them in a way that it changed their ways. And the Bible tells you how you do this. You restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. So you have some people who have walked out. And if you can save them by snatching them from the fire. Not to say if you can. Amen. Then by all means. Because God is in the saving business. Try your move to bring them back from a backsliding state under God. With the help of God. If you can. But there is another way that he says. He said, having mercy with fear, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. In other words, this speaks to the wisdom now of how you deal with these things. If it's an issue that you cannot handle, you have to be very careful. And sometimes you have to use the help of experienced people to decide how to move. Um, not everybody you going to win. And, and therefore, if it's an issue or something that you know is above your head, instead of trying to jump in, Head on. Get an experienced person who can guide you in doing that. And the Bible tells you why. Consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Um, yeah, yeah, I've seen instances where people had the right motive in doing what they had to do. Sister Suzette Dunbar, in her, in her teaching on, um, on Saturday to the, to the young people, she made reference of the fact that in her younger days, she wanted, she was preaching and she saw a young man and she was preaching to him and she started to realize that she liked the young guy and instead of backing out, she continued till, you know what happened, she got pregnant for the young guy. Amen. So she started with the right motive but was not careful enough and didn't realize that she needed to, to, to be careful in how to handle some issues. Alright? And I hope that wisdom will speak to us. I, I've been to places and I've, I, I, where I realize, look here, you're gone too far. You need to back off now. Because if you continue, praise God, you're going to go into a, a state where the devil is going to get the, the, the laugh off of you at the end of the day. So in some cases, we have to have mercy with fear. Hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. And then he concluded, for anybody who now decide that they are going to contend for the faith. He said, you can be assured of ending words of, of, of what Jude had to say. He says, no unto him. I want us to understand, when you have made up your mind to really serve God, when you have made up your mind to contend for the faith, the body of facts, taught by the apostles and the church, he said, no unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He said to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Historically, a lot of us don't realize that this was a song that was sung by the first century church. No, I don't know the melody. I don't know the, the chords or the, how it sounds or how they used to sing it. But what I know, what I'm glad is that the apostle was able to pull from this and to use it. Probably if it was in this time, with a pull the song, you must fight, be brave against all evil. Never run and even look behind. You know, he was saying, God is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence. In other words, not blameless, but faultless. There's a difference. Faultless means that when the devil looks at you, he knows that there, you did something, but the record is saying that you did nothing. Blameless is different because blameless means he can blame you for something. You did, all of us have fall at some point. But I'm glad that when we decide to contend for the faith, we decide, and remember one of the things is wholeness of living. When we decide to contend for the faith, 
then at the end of the day, Jesus is going to take you, sister. He's going to take you, brother. And he's going to present you faultless before his presence. Amen. Tonight, I'm, I'm glad that we were able to go through the book of Jude. I'm glad that we were able to look at what Bishop has been talking about in relation to contending for the faith. Praise God. I'm glad and I hope that we have had better understanding now of what we're talking about. When you hear the preacher preach and says, contend for the faith. Amen. We are pulling from these same things that Jude spoke about in the first century. And let us, brethren, make up our mind that comes what may. We are going to hold on to the faith. Because guess what? We are just pilgrims passing through. Hallelujah. And there's going to come a day where all of these things that people are running down will not matter anymore. All it's going to matter is to be in the presence of the King of Kings, of the Lord of Lords. Amen. But at the same time, we need to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered. I pray God that you were blessed tonight. I pray God that you have learned something from the book of Jude. Amen. Learn the structure of the book. And know that we can try to, to, to look out for these things. Look out for those murmurers and those complainers and those who speak swelling words and those who despise dignitary and speak evil of authority and defile the flesh. Amen. Those who are willing to understand that, look here, if you do these things, God will punish you. And it might not be today. It might be in a course of nature. It might be sudden. It might be reserved. But guess what? As a child of God, now unto him, when we earnestly contend for the faith, now unto him, God, who is able to present us faultless before his throne. We thank God for his word. We thank God that he has given us what we need in this 21st century to walk holy and to walk righteousness. God bless you to walk righteous. God bless you. Bow your heads right now as we close out in prayer. Great God, we exalt you again tonight. We thank you again for your word. Your word. Your word. Your word. We thank you, God, that you have placed it upon Jude, even in the first century, to write this letter. Amen. And that we, in this time, can read it and understand. Amen. Understand that people are going to creep in unaware. But at the same time, we are grateful, amen, that we are able to use the word and to hate the deeds of people like the Nicolaitans. We are able to use the word and we can decipher between who is an apostle and who is not. We can use the word and we can decide who is for God and who is not for God. We can use the word and it can guide us in how to live. Help us, Lord Jesus, to live a life of expectancy. Help us, Lord Jesus, to live a life that is holy and pleasing to you. I pray right now, God, that you'll help us that if our lights are dim, that we'll find back that brazen altar. That we can start the process over. Amen. And we can get that fire. We can offer ourselves as a living sacrifice that is holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. God, we thank you, God, one more time for what you have done. We thank you, Lord, for this body, uh, faith apostolic ministries on this side of the vineyard. And I pray right now, God, that you will bless every hearer of the word tonight, every person who has heard the word. Heaven, Lord, just not come up, oh God, with a spirit, oh God, that is blocking out the word. We come against that. But I pray, God, that you'll help us, God, that we'll have an open heart to receive the word of God, amen, in our hearts. Help us, Lord Jesus. That we'll not just receive it, but we'll apply it. And we'll walk worthy of the calling that you have called us. Thank you right now, Jesus, for your love, for your mercy and your grace upon our lives. Oh, God, bless us one more time. Oh, God, as we look to you again in the mighty and the most exalted name, the name of Jesus. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. In the name of Jesus, I pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Praise God. Remember, we have service on Sunday. Amen. Come out to service and be blessed. And I pray, God, that we will, we will start having an attitude of praying up for the service. Amen. You know, as I said before, the enemy has been trying his best in this season. You know, the scripture talk about his, the devil being short. as a short time and he's come down with anger, knowing that his season is short. But we thank God that we serve a God who no devil can mess with. 
I mean, as long as we decide to wrap ourselves in his arm and to be in his saving station. So help us, Lord, to pray for the services that are coming on Sunday. Continue to pray for your leadership. Continue to pray for your bishop. Continue to pray for each other. And let us keep ourselves in the love of God. God bless you in the mighty and the most exalted name of Jesus. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.